الشمس والبحر بشفل ضرب على الاستاذ طه عبيد النحاس وحاليا بنشر المنصب كونسلتنت وتكنولوجي ات لانشاير تيتشنج هوسبيتال ان يو كي وهيتكلم النهارده عن موضوع في غايه الاهميه اللي هو البري دايس كير اورجنايزيشن وكومبلمنتاريتي المنصب ده روش هيتكلم عن كام موضوع فقط يعني انا بس اناونسمنت بسيط في شيء من الاساس كده اللي عاوز اشرح فيه الحلقه دي الراحه كده Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Shaikh Chan, Dr. Kwok, uh, and Martin Lee again, who so I'm uh, Mansoura. I'm really pleased to be with you here. Uh, my talk today will be optimizing free dialysis care. And I can tell you straight away that this study is wrong. It's wrong because we don't know if every, if every patient with CKD, chronic disease, will end on dialysis. They might die before reaching that stage, and they might choose not to have dialysis. It's their choice with the advice and education. It was very interesting to hear the discussion of the first and second group, because I hope some of the questions or the concerns raised could be answered or discussed here as well. So basically, let's define what's advanced, advanced kidney disease. Uh, I hope you know the stages of the group in a few years uh, uh, about uh, chronic kidney disease in, in the five stage, actually one of the stages which is treated by them even further to 3 A and B. And the second reason why they've done that, they don't just need more walk, it's just to, to um, classify the patient according to the cardiovascular risk. The talk today will be fo focusing on stage 5, which is any stage renal disease, GFR is at 2 minutes a minute, patients not yet on dialysis or any form of renal disease, so on transplant or any other form. So basically they are um, the stage 5, and not, yet, not yet on dialysis. But I have to tell you they are a minority. Looking at the data from the states, this is about 19 million Americans with chronic kidney disease. And the chronic kidney disease stage 5 is only 0.2% of the whole uh, CKD cohort. But the majority is actually in, uh, in stage 3, as you can see. And I hope you know that information uh, before as well. It's 4.3% CKD stage 3. So why, why CKD 5 is important when it's only 0.2%? And the reason is because the cardiovascular risk is very high. Out of 100 CKD stage 5 patients, 36 will get a cardiovascular event, whether that's a cardiac infarction or a cardiac steroid or whatever, but it's an event including a cardiac infarction. And they die more, so they, high, they have the highest death rate as well, particularly um, stage 5. So that's why we're concerned about them. Although they are a minority within the CKD, but they have very high cardiovascular risk and they need attention. So how to optimize their care of the advanced kidney, advanced um, chronic kidney disease um, stage five? Basically, a few points to discuss and, and, and a little bit more about. Um, the main things are to refer the early to the renal service, the renal clinics, and, uh, and preferably with an indicated um, renal clinic. Uh, that runs uh, in a multidisciplinary approach. When I say multidisciplinary approach, it means that just more, more, more than one member of the team, like a nephrologist, a uh, specialist nurse, dealing with different aspects of the chronic kidney disease, we'll discuss that at a later stage. Um, educate patient, giving them options to choose from, to choose what they, are, they will be facing in the future, and clinically manage the condition and its complication, which is stage five. And prepare them again for the future by either re enrichment therapy or conservative management. So, refer to the renal service. I would like cases because hopefully that will give you uh, uh, a wake up as well. So, these are real cases from my clinic. Um, very similar. Two patients, 50 years old, both of them. 20 years history of diabetes and hypertension. Um, and um, both had. Stage 3, CKD stage 3, seven years ago. But Mr. A refused the help of his GP, the general practitioner of the UK, and he refused to be referred to the in service and then on a few occasions. That was his choice. So he had a poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension, um, and he's not compliant with general, doesn't take the medication all of that. So, and finally, he was forced by symptoms to attend the clinic in general this year with GFR of 8 minutes a minute. He was in a miserable state, I can tell you. And he started dialysis. I was a tunnel line, firmly gas. As the inpatient, he had to be admitted because of unwell. So you're surprised by how the patient's still, still there in the UK, because the patient refused the help. It was 
given by still there, seen in this year. The same vision, same age, same history. He was known to me for five years when he was sick in his same street, and his GFR dropped slowly over time. And he, he in January, did the same when GFR reached, he was there already in the clinic, so he, his GFR um, was low as eight, and he started dialysis at the same time with the functioning of Vista, which he had last year. He started dialysis as an outpatient. Um, he came from his home, dialysis was the life unit, driving himself, had dialysis, already visited the unit a few times before, met all the stuff before, he knew what he's expected. He, he knew everything, what he's going to have. It wasn't a shock at all for him. It was all smooth. I don't use Arabic in, in, in lectures, but this is just to make it more clear. The difference between the two types of sudden dialysis of life, who would end in, but now, now, but by our husband, who would end in, will Mr. A, who would end in. This is crash landing, as we say it, and this is just smooth landing. So he's, he landed smoothly on dialysis. He knew everything he would be seeing and having, and he was not in the function of his life. And she's dialysis with the own driving as well. So you can see how, how big difference, the same kind of thing. Um, Mr. A he had uh, infection, uh, he had his prior sister, which failed, he's diabetic, and then he had a infection, one of his uh, while Mr. B was still down and happy. End of this book, last one. Um, Mr. A unfortunately was admitted unwell with fluid overload because he always comes to dialysis with fluid overload and he died with MI. While Mr. B is still alive, happy dialysis. So you can see very similar star but different fate. And that's why we want to avoid by optimizing the care of the patient because Mr. B had a better optimal care. Not because we didn't offer to Mr. A, but it was his choice not to accept it. And it was surprising we knew that many years ago, since 1998, we knew that um, that patient would um, refer, be referred later in service, would likely to start uh, dialysis acutely, um, which is the, the, the set of cash manager. While the patient was referred early on, likely to start dialysis um, electively, in an elective fashion, or planned. We knew this data from a long time ago, but some patients still present in the same way. I'll be honest with you, there are many studies which show the same result, comparing early referral and late referral to the service, many, many studies over the years. So um, I've just picked um, this uh, meta-analysis systemic, systemic review, relatively new. This one is not very new, 2007, and this is a systematic uh, meta-analysis um, in the American Journal of Medicine. I think it's from the States, and they are comparing the late and versus, uh, 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 versus the late, the earlier and late referrals. Um, but this is 22, it's a pool of 22 studies. Um, obviously, the definition of late and, refer, uh, late, late and early refer, uh, the studies are different, but they pulled 22 studies with uh, more than 12,000 patients in it, dialysis patients. Um, and obviously, um, the, the early referral, if the patient would refer early in all these studies, had better survival and also had less hospital stay compared to the late. From last year, there was a systematic review looking at the same thing at the late versus early firm, that patient from pre dialysis patient and late the renal service, and they found exactly the same finding. In addition, there was a uh, significance with the starting, but there is, we knew from the data that the referring early patient would like to start dialysis with functioning first of all, the referring patient late would like to start with healthy access, hospital access, like a early care. So, as I said, we know this data before. We know the advantage of referring the patients early to the renal service. They will have a better survival after starting renal system therapy for years to come. And they are less frequently admitted to the hospital with short hospital stay if they refer early. And they will like to start electively, smooth landing rather than acutely. And they like to start with a functioning permanent access fistula or if they dialysis, that's their choice. And in fact, they like to have more dialysis and more home-based therapy than, than hemodialysis because they will have the time to discuss options. Uh, late referral will be associated also with poor outcome predictors like anemia because of the underuse of it. So they didn't have a chance to use it. And hyperalbuminemia, malnutrition, they didn't have a chance to sit with the dietitian to check. So obviously, if you have more time, you'll use the time. But if you miss the chance, you'll miss it. So, the dedicated normal cleaners clinic. Um, these are, are, are the clinics dedicated for um, CKD5, basically. 
population need and more attention. Um, rather than a general nephrology clinic where you see everyone. Still, the two models in the UK, the, the general nephrology clinic where you have a mix of all the CKD stages and the dedicated uh, low clearance where you only have CKD5 patients. To give them more attention, to discuss about things which might not be relevant to other patients, and we're just giving more than the more time. But also, more importantly, um, in a multidisciplinary team. So usually the clinic run, I used to have a slide which unfortunately is not here, but I'll show you in, um, how the clinic runs in terms of you have the nephrologist, you have the uh, specialist nurses and different types of specialist nurses, you have the anemia nurse, you have the hospital access nurse, you have the dietitian, you have the social workers, you have everything the patient might need. And they have the, the, the advanced kidney care nurse who take talk to them about education and, and, and address all the concerns. Because sometimes, quite often, the patient might not discuss things with one person and just have to decide with another person, just like um, he forget or whatever the reason. So seeing more members of the team and more than their care, giving them uh, more options and, and chances, etc. So the names are different, advanced kidney care clinic, without clinic or low clearance clinic, but the, the idea is the same. And again, it's a multidisciplinary team. And, and, and again, there is evidence showing that the advantage of just a dedicated clinic is independent uh, by itself, risk uh, factor, not, not seeing it, in a, in a, or seeing it in a, in a, in a low clearance clinic will give the patient a better survival, if you like, better managing their condition, uh, slowing the progression of the CKD, and postpone the need for reinforcement survey. I'll show you some evidence on that, about that as well. And like we saw that, collective DIA, functioning system and increase home based therapy because of education they would have during this period. So this this data I think from the states and they actually compared a year survival after starting dialysis, um, 190,000 dialysis patients um, who had um, been seen in a nephrology clinic, dedicated to pre dialysis clinic three months, more than three months and less than three months. So just two groups, one less than three months and one more than three months, and the one who seen more than three months in the dedicated nephrology clinic had a better survival a year after starting dialysis. And these data from Leicester in the UK, where they were looking at the aim of that study was to look at the predictors of, um, of, of starting of, of, uh, of starting <coughs> dialysis electively versus acutely. Why patients would start dialysis acutely or versus, versus uh, electively. And attendance as pre-dialysis, dedicated pre-dialysis clinic was one of the independent factors to predict that the patient would like to start electively. So the same information. This is just CKD5 patient 109. So we, we, we know the importance of the, the root clearance clinic. But I'll tell you later what we do in the root clearance clinic or the advanced kidney care clinic. Educating, educating the patient and giving them options. Very important. Um, and that's something simple. It doesn't need a lot of money or resources to do. It just needs some better system. And you can adopt it in any center, anywhere. Because you can educate your patient by different methods. You can educate your patients through giving them lectures, booklets, websites. You can use DVD, CD with information on it that they can read if they are. Uh, you can, some nurses do home visits to educate the patient in their own environment. Some patients will learn more in their own environment, seeing their home, if they can home, do home dance as an option. And sometimes we invite them all together in an education day where they come and speak to each other. And sometimes um, CKD stage, uh, different stages mixed together, speak together with their own experience and symptoms, usually helpful for them as well. But you can, you can make it very simple as one to one um, counseling. You can just sit with your patient and tell them what you're going to tell them. Simple things. You tell them why they have kidney failure in the first place, causes kidney failure, what causes of acute, they might have suffered with acute kidney injury. They might, have, they might get a kidney injury or of chronic later on. So you can tell them about how to avoid that, what's the causes, why they have it. Ways. Tell them about the symptoms, what they get, might get in the future, so they expect it not as a shock, but they understand they might get that in the future. Tell them about different options of dialysis, the different types of renal replacement therapy, whether that's a hemodialysis, a dialysis, what about transplantation? Tell them about they can have a transplant, and explore they can have their life goals, relatives, friends, and give them a kidney. So um, it's important, complication of chronic disease as well, what they will be expecting at later stages, they are earlier stage. Medication, what medication they will likely to have, to give the medication in the kidney failure is quite, quite special, and why they need them, and, uh, and, and what medication to avoid, that's very important as well. So educating the patient is not a very, very difficult task, it's not very taxing, you can do it. You can use whatever I said. 
But education, education patient is not just a uh, luxury, it's important because it's uh, it in case survival as well. Children have a better survival patient will indicate a better survival condition in the seed education. They like to as well to start the house effectively rather than uh, unplanned or acutely as it says. They like it to um, have a better uh, mood, better um, well-being. Uh, it would enhance their, their, um, uh, their uh, mood and reduce the level of anxiety. Obviously, they are anxious people. Having the blood, such, such kind of diagnosis like chronic disease with all its implications, it's very, very shocking. It's not very bad news. So, educating them how to get through that is really important. And then, given power, how, how to, to allow them to control the condition, you probably come across patients with diabetes, and, and the, the diabetic patient is an example of how they empower patients, how they uh, control the disease. They know the insulin, they, they inject the insulin. They, 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 some, at some stages, they've been diabetic for many years. They were even better knowledgeable, and more than doctors seeing them in the first time, in terms of what, how, how the disease uh, affects them. Because their regulation is different. So, empowering the patient is very important. Um, also, to improve the self care, to maintain them in jobs, and affect their families and their social life. All of it. And there are evidence, there's evidence that um, this, this uh, special um, education program increased survival of patients. So, this is a study from Italy 229 new patients who didn't grow up for the survival of 37 uh, with 8 months, and they, uh, they um, were compared, well, this whole group, um, they found that the group who had um, a proper pre-dialysis education program had a better survival than the patient who had just unstructured care. So the post group were saying, it's not a late referral thing, we're not comparing here between late referral and early referral, comparing between patients who know the service, all of them, but some group of them, some group of them had a proper structured education program compared to the one who just came to the clinic with no structured program, education program, and the one with a structured education did better in terms of they lived longer basically. So it's important. Um, and this study from Canada, 355 new patients, they look the same, but this was more structured, more detailed psychoeducational intervention. So they look at all the aspects of psychology of the patient and their all the anxiety, all the psychological problems associated with the, with the chronic disease. And they found that the, the, the one who received that kind of program of education is better up to 20 years. Still, they're doing better than the one who received it before dialysis. So you can see how the effect is got. <coughs> so what we do is about kidney care clinic. How we manage them with the, the, the clinical condition of these patients. Basically, every time they come to the clinic, we review the symptoms, ask them about the symptoms. Symptoms, you really symptoms, basically, if they are stage 5, or GFR, or 10, or 11, we start asking them what symptoms, do you have any symptoms that you well? Simple question to ask. Um, symptoms of load or load. Um, before, we, before starting examining them, just symptoms of load or load, symptoms of complications. Um, and then we look at how to score the progression. It's never too late. Don't say, well, it's GFR 10. Start out soon. No, it's never too late. You can all still think about how to do the progression of the chronic disease. And it's basically by managing the risk factors that would progress them, like controlling the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the proteinuria, uh, trying to maintain that less than half gram per day, and addressing, most importantly, all the time, addressing the cardiovascular risk. I showed you early on that they have high cardiovascular risk, high cardiovascular events, and they would die more, more of them would die. So addressing that is still important. Treatment of complications, what complications they will get, metabolic acidosis, sodium bicarbonate. It's not only to treat metabolic acidosis, but there's evidence from studies, not, not many, about one or two studies, one of them from Professor Yaku from London, showed that giving sodium bicarbonate was the progression of chronic kidney disease per se as an independent uh, factor. Treating the anemia, the target is 10 to 12. Uh, how to achieve that, you measure the iron status, they might need iron first. Oral iron is not absorbed in CKD stage 5, it doesn't get absorbed. Don't give oral iron to CKD 5, please. It's intravenous iron. How that will fill them? That's if they need iron, because you have to check it first. And they might not need iron, they might already fill it. But if they need iron, please give it intravenously. Um, the, yeah, as I said, you've got your, your target to achieve, not more, not below. Um, and then the, um, the mineral bone disease as well, the, 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 the 
bone disease, which is uh, one of the complications of CKD. Secondary measure the calcium, the phosphate, the primary hormone, and correct that if needed. If the hypercalcemic give calcium, if the primary hormone is high, give um, active vitamin D, because the kidney won't make it at that stage. So just simple things to, 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 to check every clinic and treat. Uh, medication review, see what they are taking, advise them to avoid the of drugs, and destroy the plenty of drugs out, the toxic they will finish off the kidney. So some of them will be surprised still with it, so you have to advise that if you've if you if not done that before. Um, if you other medication they take, also advise them about the trust media becoming with the cardiologist for any other scans, engine or whatever. Explain to them that the contrast media in that in the scan they go for would probably affect the kidney and they might put them on dialysis. They have to be aware of that. Because you don't you don't know what other physicians will do and give them. Not, not aware of the condition. So they themselves should be aware. So a nephrotoxic is not just an drug, it's everything that you can think of. Any medication that is not given in the right dose according to the GFR will be nephrotoxic because it will accumulate. So they should be aware that a kidney failure patient, the GFR is low, they have to mine the dose, just as simple as that mine the dose. Some of the medication doesn't matter, but some medication and antibiotics should be reduced when they are at that stage. Dietary advice, I'll tell you about that later, but it's important. So these are the things you do in the clinic when you see them at that stage. Just give you more attention about possible symptoms, treatment complications, dietary reviews. Not necessarily you do it yourself. If you got that dish in your center, she can do it or we can do it for you. But if you haven't, then you might have a touch on that as well. Vaccination, why is that important? So we vaccinate the, the, the CKD5, particularly CKD5, not before that stage, to the others we and pneumococcal vaccine and the seasonal flu vaccine because um, when they start dialysis, they, there's a high risk of, of um, getting the blood, uh, uh, not through the machine, but through the environment as well, during the blood. So it's better, and, and the guidelines in the UK is telling us we should vaccinate them at that stage. Because if you get too late, the immune system will be more um, weak and it, they might not respond to the vaccine. So it's better to make the chance of that at that stage and give it now so can they do a response to it. Um, and surprisingly, we also vaccinate patients of retinal dialysis, but you can ask me why. Because they're not going through hemodialysis. Because the retinal patient can interchange between that modality and hemodialysis at any time. The retinal dialysis might walk, might check them, bring them back, they might have retinitis, and they might come, go back to hemodialysis for a day, so it's better. And then if, they, if, they are, if it's late, they won't respond. They, they won't form an immune network against the first species. Just do it now. Why do you the vaccine and flu vaccine season? Season I mean every year you do it. Um, because, um, I mean annually you do it every year. Because the immune system is, is also weak and it's better to vaccinate them. But even if it's not the age for it, even younger patients with CCD at that stage, it's better to vaccinate them. Right, what advice else we gave, we gave them about these factors we talked about? Controlling the diabetes. Better to monitor at home if they have a machine, that's the best that they have. Power and control of the disease. They have a target, the HP1C should be less than seven. Hypertension, better to monitor at home. You can get a machine at home and have a dial for your proper reading. Uh, and they also have a control, advise them about using salt and diet. Uh, tell them the target, what they are, should be achieving. Uh, Taking the patient should be achieving one surgery over eight. And if they are consuming more than half a gram per day, it should be even slightly less, 125 or 75. Again and again, avoid the toxic drugs, like menstrual anti inflammatory drugs. Mind the doses when we get any drug, the contrast we talked about. General lifestyle things, if they are overweight, high BMI, if the price can produce weight, they might need help with that, with the addition of general practitioner. Definitely stop smoking. They already have a high cardiovascular risk, so you don't want to make calls. They have to stop smoking. You just advise. Exercise of the high BMI, exercise in general. It's useful to be the and the last patient I'm sure you that last year. Implication on their life, social life, their job, their family, their career, what they're going to do in the future. As I said, CKD diagnosis would be shocking to them, so supporting them, not just the medical thing. Think of them, about them as a human being. They're just human. They have family, children, they have a job to go to, they have a career. They want the beginning of their career, their life. So um, just just see that touch of the, of, the, of the social thing as well, and the, the human part of them. 
So we talked about the medication. Just one thing you can do, as I said, it's never too late. You can always try it for progression. Uh, although ACE inhibitors is known to reduce proteinuria at earlier stage, but we found that actually they are like, the opposite, or they don't be that helpful. Uh, or they might not reduce proteinuria at later stage. And this is study from Sheffield, with Professor Group, uh, Professor Mahas Group. Uh, and we stopped the, the ACE inhibitor at the low clearance clinic at the GFR. Improved for most of this patient, 61% improved GFR, and that was sustained for a few years as well. So think about, about what else you can do to, to save the time. Just think about the analysis. Addressing the cardiovascular risk, we said very high cardiovascular risk, but not just the traditional risk factor you think about, which everyone knows, attention, smoking, high BMI, all this you know, and I'm sure you hopefully will do that. But also think about non-traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, Proteinuria itself, and anemia, which is corrected, high parathyroidism, which you control that, and we have a parathyroidism, the calcium of phosphate abnormality itself, and vitamin D deficiency. Surprisingly, they could be vitamin D deficient. So some of them you might do something about, some you can't, like the Proteinuria, you might not be able to do something about it, but you should be just aware of non traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. That's your advice, as I said, if you had a dietary that addition in the that would be a bonus, and then what, what, just roughly what you advise them, their caloric needs, you should meet their caloric needs, you shouldn't be malnourished. Um, it should be advised about renal diet, which is low, low potassium diet and low phosphate diet. If they're diabetic as well, this is an addition advice about diabetic diet. Low salt diet if they have intensive, if they have high cholesterol, low cholesterol diet. Um, if they have a high PMI, it should be advised to lose weight. Uh, and fluid restriction at later stage, then we should advise them how to, um, to manage the restriction. It's hard. Have you tried, especially in a warm country like Asia, have you ever tried to drink one liter per day? It's hard. So uh, there should be strategies toward that, and advice as well, because they might not count things which they think is not fluid, like whatever, um, um, yogurt or whatever, but they should be advised how to fluid uh, restrict themselves. With a dance station or a free dance station at, at early so, um, take it to progression. The very common question, they will be, you would only be asked that question. When I will start dialysis doctor? It's difficult to answer it. Very difficult. You only can use the history of the patient to tell you how they've done in the past, how they will drop them. Skip this slide because there is a lecture, a lecture about them. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and then the last point of, of the plan of the care is to prepare them for the future, as we said. Uh, prepare them for the end of this or take away the The patient might choose not to have dialysis. Um, it's just their choice. And it could be more, 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 more expected that that's the choice of the more dialysis. We advise them about what does it mean not to have dialysis, which is if they die, but there might be the choice, they have not. So um, you still support them. Conservative management is doing all everything we've said apart from just dialysis. Treat their complications, treat their risk factors, treat their complications, everything apart from that, of the dialysis. And they might be at the last stage of their life, supporting them through that end of life care, and that's a big subject by itself. And then the choices of dialysis. If they choose to have dialysis, would they want it at hospital or at home? And I appreciate that sometimes when they, it's not available or not suitable for the patient. But it should be all discussed and given that um, choice. Transplantation, if they have a live donor, friends and family that give them the people. Or in countries which have a disease list or a catastrophic list, it could be enrolled to that if they are suitable and fit. And then family access, which is the doing the access in the right time, so it's ready for them when they start renal replacement therapy. And again, that's difficult to predict because it's, it's related to the pr prediction of progression. Um, only the history can tell you about it, but um, the, the, the advice is it's better to have an AVFIS that was 6 to 12 months to give you a range rather than a dead uh, day uh, before starting dialysis to facilitate function. It's not just creating the FISTA and leave it, because some of the discussion we had earlier was about who's, who should, which role is it, the nephrologist or the surgeon. I think it's the team. Um, so you create the FISTA and then you do what we call surveillance. Surveillance which you keep in an eye on the fistula and how it developed. So the, the surgeon should see the patient after four to six weeks after the surgeon and see how it falls. Some of the fistula um, die straight away, they don't function. And some of them 
um, develop their pool. So someone needs to look at that. So um, it's not just the surgeon, but the, 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 the physician as well, bringing them back to the project, bringing them back to the new clearance clinic, they will look at it. Especially, hopefully, with the vascular access nurse, and usually the vascular access nurse is a trained training of new dialysis, because most of the nephrologists, most of you, won't need to themselves, most, most of you. And if you're not needing yourself, you can, you can see the fistula as, as functioning, but in fact, needling it could be difficult, whether it's deep or not in a straight line. So it, in, in, in few occasions, you can think that the fistula is functioning, but actually on needling it, it's very hard difficulty. So we're having, as well, the team, a member of the team who actually need to the fistula. Uh, it's not to do with the nurse doctor thing, but it's just someone who's been doing it. So I think both should be seeing the fistula and keeping an eye on it month after month and how it develops. Because if you created it six months ago, 12 months ago, if you have done my job, but it's not developing, then you've done nothing. The fistula should be, should be ready. You have the luxury of five with the, with the optional dialysis because you only need to, need to do six weeks before for the healing and the training, so that should be enough. If it's slightly better, the eight weeks would be better. Uh, but you have more time. Um, last thing to mention about uh, how often you see these patients. Um, well, I advise them to do 65 minutes to see every uh, one to six weeks according to the need and the progression as well. But this just got the flow evidence based behind that, just not advice. So finally, to summarize um, how to optimize your advanced uh, chronic kidney disease care by early seeing your patient first in the service early on. Um, having preferably a dedicated low clearance clinic or post um, uh, care clinic in a multidisciplinary team, educating the patient, giving them options, empowering them, uh, and managing their condition and its complications, uh, and have a letter to have some, some control over the disease and prepare them for the future. Thank you very much.
But we have filtration with the test of all two in two of As you know, the English of the theory of my heart is correcting the algorithms. Just contravert. Oh. Oh. Contravert. In, in correcting the local code. Yes. Yeah, oh. Because, because uh, it gives the vision of locus and it was. Uh, Are you talking so about analysis or data yeah? Are you talking about data analysis? Right. Okay. The vision of a local. And we know this system. So your content makes the, 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 the uncontrolled, the transcription. I disagree with that. Sorry, I disagree with that. It's more of a system. Uh, I think it's important to correct it for the customer. It's very important. Uh, I don't see all the patients who will have such a bad problem will have like retention and fruit overload. Um, and there are things you can do with the fruit overload and the hypertension. You can give them a hypertensive, you can strip the flow, see how much. Because some of the patients drink gallons and gallons of water and flow. So um, I don't say it myself that sodium bicarbonate will make them all go to the There are only few of them that might, and you can do something about it. But so it will be eight patients, yeah. eight, four or five. Uh, it has uh, high hypertension and overload the patient. No, all of them will have hypertension, so there will be hypertension or normal tension. I overload the patient. Yes. Can you say sodium bicarbonate? If you, yeah, perhaps the question would be, if you already have someone who's hypertensive, already hypertensive, and already have overloaded, and you and metabolic acidosis, would you start sodium bicarbonate yes. for that scenario? Yes. Um, then you might treat those first, and then uh, and postpone the decision of the sodium bicarbonate later on. So you might control the food overload first, and then hypertension, and then start sodium bicarbonate. What's the reason for the weight uh, my question is regarding the proper stage of uh, uh, holding the ACE inhibitors uh, or ARBs in uh, this category of patients and also the optimal antiproteinuric doses of different uh, ARBs. I read in, um, in some tickets that for those that is 100 mg for cancer, that it is uh, 16 mg and for every certain 900 mg. Uh, uh, this is one question. Another one. Can I answer that first? Yes. Okay. To answer the, because it's two parts of it, the answer is more for both of them, basically. There isn't, there isn't time where you have to stop this. There, there isn't evidence behind that. There's no request for drug study done. All what we did was just a think total uh, study with just a few patients, but we showed that some of them improved. So basically, you have to use your clinical judgment. At that later stage, the message is the ACE inhibitor might not be as helpful as earlier stage. Especially for the one who is still protonoric on the ACE or ARP. So the ACE or ARP didn't help them. And the GFR is actually going down. They like that for sclerotic elderly patients. So you have to use your clinical judgment and see, well, this is a elderly patient. The GFR has been, well, it's going down and the, the ACE or ARP didn't help. And it's already is GFR 12. Let's stop it. Right? Okay. So there's no ideal time. The second part of your question, there's no optimal dose for the ACE and Well, the advice of general practice thing, which is not evidence based again, is to try ACE first, the maximum dose, and see what the response to know here. Some, some studies, well, it's not very many, and, and actually there are other studies which oppose that, they added R as well. And, and I train the dose according to publishing, the maximum tolerated dose. So the so high is a yeah, it's clinical judgment. Another uh, point you mentioned that uh, hemoglobin A1C, this one, uh, seven, uh, less than seven, is your target. If, uh, before, you, you, do you think that uh, uh, this one is not affected by the urobic environment and some uh, are using what is called the carbomylated hemoglobin? Yes, we use that now. We don't use the HMP. We so use using carbomylated. Yeah, we don't use that anymore. But uh, I know that you're still using it. So, yeah. Thank you. What sorry? What type of concentration? What? We have 8.4, we have 1.1. You're talking about IV or oral? Oral, yeah. Oral, IV, IV, IV. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't use IV. Oral. Use oral. So you buy car, 500 milligrams, to start with one tablet twice a day. But it depends on the by car, how low. If you go by car of um, 18, 20, you can use one tablet twice a day. If it's um, 14, you can use one gram, two thousand, yes, it depends. If you dilate as well, everything is dilated up to the maximum.
that's the the way those are the response, the pain response. There's a lot of people discussing this issue with the conversations and the conversations with the whole group and the whole group and the whole group. Which is the number range we have. Yes. This is the number range.